Welcome everybody to today's webinar and the Calm series. This is the first uh, in the series this academic year. There's going to be six in total. So thank you very much to colleagues in Calm uh, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute at NUI Galway. Uh, delighted uh, to be uh, continuing our, our work with uh, Calm, which has been a very active group and has put on a fascinating series uh, of sessions, which are actually available as recordings on our YouTube channel. So you might wish to check those out from events that took place last year. I'm especially delighted that our speaker today is Cassie Smith Christmas, who has made an extraordinary contribution to the Moore Institute uh, while being a, a research fellow, a Mary Curie fellow. And uh, we've been very happy to have her here and to be working with her. Uh, I'm going to turn over now to uh, Dr. John Walsh. John is director, uh, co-director, I should say, of the Center for Linguistics uh, and Multilingualism. So, John, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Dan, for the welcome and for the support of the Moore Institute um, for our center. And I'm delighted to welcome everybody to this academic year's program of seminars. This is the first of six seminars in the series. And I also want to welcome some of our students from the new MSc in Applied Multilingualism who are joining us today. And I'm delighted that Cassie is with us because we know Cassie for quite a while now and um, uh, are very lucky to have the benefit of her expertise here at NUI Galway on family language policy. So Cassie has recently finished a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship here at NUI Galway and she previously held fellowships with the Smithsonian Centre for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, the Irish Research Council, the Institute for, the, for Advanced Studies in the Humanities at the University of Edinburgh, and Sailsha, the Inter-University Gaelic Language Network in Scotland. Cassie has authored 24 peer-reviewed publications, including the 2016 monograph, Family Language Policy, Maintaining an Endangered Language in the Home, published by Palgrave Macmillan. So Cassie, you're very welcome. And uh, thank you for joining us in CAM today. Fair of me, John. Um, thank you so much, um, Dan and John, for those um, very, very kind introductions. I'm just so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be kicking off what promises to be a fantastic season of um, calm seminars, a fantastic year of calm seminars. So thanks so much for having me. I'll just um, share my screen now. Hopefully you can all see that. Yes. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about um, two projects, really. So um, I just, as, as um, Dan very kindly said, I just finished up a uh, Mary Skodowska Curry Fellowship here at NUI Galway. So I'm going to be talking about that project. But first of all, I'm going to be talking about um, a project that I did with, this, with the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. And a lot of, and this builds on um, my trajectory in family language policy research. So really looking at the sort of decision-making processes that happen within the family and also the child's agency within that. So in other words, it's not just a top-down approach from the parent for, to the child, but it's also what happens within the family. And then very specifically in terms of my Mary Skodowska Curry Fellowship project, looking at the interface between the family and wider society and how that trickles down to the different um, linguistic outcomes within the family. So um, the title of my talk is Severus and Society, Intergenerational Language Transmission in Irish speaking, Kurdish speaking and Polish speaking families. So um, I just want to say a few things beforehand. So first of all, huge thanks to Orla Rochelle, who is my co-PI on the Smithsonian project. And also a huge thanks to Azad Izzedine, who was my research assistant with the LAFS project. And also to Professor Tiger Herfinen, who was my mentor with the LAFS project. And also huge, huge thanks to all the families and language practitioners who have very generously and kindly given their time to these particular projects. So as I said, this research is based in family language policy. 
And one of the many questions, so family language policy, for those of you who don't know, it's a relatively new sociolinguistic subfield that is really dated at 2008 with King, Fogel, and Logan Terry's article, which really put it on the map. And one of the questions that's sort of been percolating around, but hasn't really been fully addressed in, until recently, is well, how do we define success? in intergenerational language transmission. When we talk about successful family language policy, what are we really talking about? And within literature, and there's been many, many advances, many important advances in the field over the last decade, about the decade of its existence, is this sort of tacit understanding that when we talk about successful intergenerational transmission, when we talk about successful language maintenance, when we talk about successful language, family language policy, we're sort of talking about the child's linguistic output, so what they speak, being a sort of carbon copy of the parent's linguistic input. So the idea is that the child's supposed to have an, an age appropriate copy of, um, of the parents' language use. But recently, as well as quite early in the field's trajectory, researchers have begun to question this. So in Schwartz and Virchitz's 2013 book, for example, they talk about, well, how do we define it? Are we just talking about, you know, balanced bilingualism, quote unquote, balanced bilingualism. And then recently in Wilson's monograph, um, 2020 monograph, she really emphasized the idea that actually we need to take emotion into account in this um, complex mosaic of looking at success. So she writes that children's experiences and family well-being must be seen as essential components of FLP success much more so than just this canonical um, looking at children's bilingual development. And this re really resonated with um, some of the thinking that I've been doing about language revitalization, and spe especially thinking about children's roles in language revitalization. And I think, again, so those of us who are familiar with the language policy and planning literature will know Fishman's um, Gids scale and his emphasis on intergenerational transmission in the home being um, what he terms the fulcrum. So that that is the stage which must be met. But again, it's deemed as very important, but sort of thinking about, well, what do we mean by this? How do we know that it's happened? How do we know it's been successful? And thinking about children in terms of large language revitalization movements, such as, for, for example, the Irish language, how do we conceptualize this? And I think a lot of times um, there's this, again, so before I had the sort of carbon copy, I know that's really, really old, um, <laughs> but here my image is sort of, well, I think in language revitalization, children are often thought of as sort of vessels. So this idea that if intergenerational transmission is successful, the child is like a vessel and you pour the water i.e. the language, the output into the child, and then the child's full of water and then the cycle continues. Um, but James Costa, who I had the pleasure of working with um, in the project I'll be talking about in a minute, really sort of problematizes this in terms of his work on Occitan revitalization. And he writes, children are, as initially stated, ambiguous figures within language revitalization movements. They are both a hope for a future, but the type of future they embody might not be the one hoped for within the movement. So children are all at once symbols, icons, numbers, pupils, and they're expected to take part in a number of performances in which they are required to act according to norms they might not grasp. So in other words, there's a lot of expectation for children and intergenerational transmission, but 
what I want to do today is sort of discuss two projects and how some of my data, I think, sort of lends teeth to some more theoretical discussions of what we mean by intergenerational transmission and what do we conceptualize when we think of successful intergenerational transmission. And then how does this apply to different context for multilingualism within the family? So the first project I'm going to be talking about is um, the Smithsonian project. And um, that was a project with the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, um, but centered on European languages. Um, so minor minoritized languages in Europe. And with this um, wonderful project, I really, really enjoyed doing it. Um, I got to work with Ira Korkaguina, down in the Cork Arena Grail Talked in County Kerry um, with the project, The Intersection of Language and Community in Cork Arena. And so this was an 18 month ethnographic project in tandem with other teams. And it was very much centered on a community ethnography. And so I participated um, in a number of um, activities organized by Ira Cork Arena and as my co um, principal investigator Orla Rochelle is the director of TUSMA. So TUSMA means a good start, a squelga in Irish. And um, this program is developed to support families and children use Irish. And it also, this, this project also dovetailed on um, a previous project that I had done um, with an Irish Research Council grant that, that compared um, families who spoke Irish in the home and then families in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland who spoke Gaelic as a home language. So in terms of Cork Aguina, so um, Taigo Herfinen has um, done a uh, done some work there in his quite well-known article within family language policy, his 2013 article. And this is a quite famous quote that a few researchers use is this idea that his findings showed that the parents frequently remarked that there are no accidental Irish speakers anymore. And I think that one of the reasons why this quote has been, been taken up and discussed in the literature so widely is that it really underscores the decision-making processes inherent in family language policy. So family language policy, again, just to be clear, it does, um, it does look at sort of the influence of society on the family, but it's not sort of how, say, Irish language policy governs the family. It's more about the decisions made within the family and the different synergies and also disconnects between um, what the families are doing with their language use in the very private sphere of the home and how this connects or doesn't connect with what's going on in their wider sociocultural milieu. And so uh, Professor Herfinen's work then built on, um, also built on O'Regan's findings in the Cork of Lina Talked that was showing um, signs of decline of intergenerational transmission in this area. And this decline in intergenerational transmission was very palpable within the community. And that really was the impetus for Tusma, um, which again means a good start in Irish. And this was um, initially when it was conceived, it was um, based on the TUV, um, inspired in part by the TUV program in Wales. So it really does sort of in, in terms of its, its broad objectives and what it achieves, um, three sort of main things. So first of all, it supports parents in making the decision to speak Irish with their children, if they haven't already made that decision, and then helps them su to sustain it. And it does so um, by making spaces where the children have um, sufficient and good input in Irish. And it also gives them a space to also um, use the language, so to produce output. 
And then crucially, and um, it helps them foster a very positive emotional relationship with the language um, through centering the use of the Irish language on very fun activities, as you see here, pictured here. So in doing this work, I started thinking about, okay, so what are the goals for intergenerational transmission? Because I had a lot of opportunity to um, participate in events with other, with language practitioners and go to um, training, um, training seminars, training workshops about supporting children's use of language. And from this, now I, I like building models. I just think that it's fun. Um, but I started thinking, and this, it came through the interviews and then also this one particular workshop which I attended um, a day long workshop in Killarney with other, um, with the language practitioners working with, with children. And I started thinking, okay, I think I can sort of pinpoint, sort of more clearly delineate now what um, parents, um, community members, and practitioners want when they conceptualize, okay, intergenerational transmission has been successful. So in this, and I call this model the Severus model, um, Severus or Cyrus, depending on your dialect, means richness in Irish. And this word kept popping up again and again through, through the interviews, you know. Um, but what I argue is that we can sort of, that the overall goal is, is richness, is severus. And that's what caregivers and language practitioners in the Corpus and Goyle talked want for the children. And so that's the sort of overall reaching goal. And within this, I argue that there are sort of three main component parts. So the first one is that the child's language use align is competence. And so this, I mean, in very much the way that normally um, we as, as applied linguists might um, describe competence, linguistic competence. So that the children's language use um, aligns with age appropriate speech norms. So in terms of syntax, morphology, et cetera. The second part is what I call local. And so in this, um, one of the aspects that came clear through going through um, the training um, with members of Ira Korkakuina was the importance of, of localness and this sort of placeness of the language so that the, the children's language use aligned with local speech norms. However, I want to really emphasize that this, it's different than um, some of the cases that you might get in other minority languages. Um, Catherine Boiler talks a lot about this in her work on authenticity, that uh, even though local was valorized, this didn't denigrate any other dialects and it didn't denigrate the standard in Kaijan. It just um, was something that made this place special. So therefore, it was important to at least be aware of the local speech norms. But if a child used um, a feature from a different dialect, that wouldn't be um, problematic. So I just wanna make that very clear. Um, and then the last part is what I term embodied. And this sort of goes back to Wilson's, the, the point from Wilson's book on family language policy that I talked about a bit earlier. And that's the idea that actually you have to take emotions into account. So by embodied, I don't mean the physical body. What I mean is that um, the children want to speak the minority language and they can experience the entirety of their social and emotional worlds through the minority language. So that it is part of them. And um, I really see embodiment as sort of the mediating link 
between um, competence, so children being able to speak the minority language, and then actual use, that they do actually speak the minority language. And so um, just again on embodied, that I see this as uh, drawing on Corsus's notion of embodiment as the accidental ground of culture and self. And um, as the, the director of Iraq or Huvina put it at the time, that um, the goal is for the minority language, in this case, Gaelga, Irish, to be a language that you can live through. And I think that one of the reasons that too small is, is very, very successful um, from my vantage point, and um, I've, I've written a number of articles on that, so I can, I can send you those if you're interested. But basically, I say it's great, and other minority languages might benefit from looking at some of the things that TUSMA is doing. Um, because again, it's not only providing the input, the chances for output, but it's fostering this particular embodiment, which I think is a crucial component of, of goals for intergenerational transmission, but also in terms of the success. And part of this is through the Kortori Bala program, which is the home visitor program. So that's where um, an Irish speaker, a Kortor, goes to somebody's house and um, helps the family integrate Irish more into the family or just works on them with their, with their severs, just using Irish and being also an external, an, an external force of the language so that the children don't just see the language as something that's only done in their home or at school, et cetera, et cetera, but something that is part of the community. And so I'm just going to show you um, Ira Korkovina um, to Sma just produced a lovely little video um, that they've, they've shared on Facebook. So I'm just going to try and show you that video because it really sort of aligns with my notions of Severus. So that's if I can do the new share. And so just a note, there is some Irish spoken in the beginning that's not subtitled, but she's just saying hello to the children and, and you know, are you ready to play? What are we going to do? And then um, you have some subtitles, but don't worry, I'm, I'm only going to show you about a minute or so of this. All right, so that's just, um, I'll go back to my PowerPoint now. So that's just to give you um, a wee blush of yog, a wee taste of what um, they're doing there in Corcuguina. And I argue that it really is um, how Severus is achieved and the, the formative role that Too Small plays in encouraging the Severus. So now we're going to shift gears and um, I'm going to talk about um, the, the Mary Skodowska Curry project that I just finished up. And in this project, 
um, I was really looking at the influence of, of society on what was happening in the family. So um, the name of the project is um, Language, Family and Society. So I realized when I had the two grants back together that I went from smiling to laughing um, with the acronyms of the grants. <laughs> but so in this one, the key question was really how is inequality perpetuated or arrested along linguistic lines. And I was looking at sort of three types of family, three different, very different contexts for multilingualism in the family. So this involved six wonderful families who I had the pleasure of working with in County Galway, where at least one child was in primary school. So two of them, Irish was their home language, two of them, Polish was their home language as Polish um, is the, the um, Polish speakers are the largest um, non-Irish uh, non national group in Ireland, and then also uh, Kurdish, Northern Kurdish as the home, as the home language, and these families um, were from Syria originally. So again, I like ethnography, so this was very eth ethnographic, and it focused on sort of their day-to-day -day linguistic experiences and was very much child-centered and um, basically consisted of sort of two main methodologies. One where, where I would visit with the families and sort of interview them, but in a very sort of informal style. And again, very much involving the children in these, these interviews, these quote unquote interviews, I'm saying, I called them research visits. And then also um, where the families were given an iPad and asked to sort of take a multimodal language diary for me over the course of the project. And so this just sort of gives you, this is just an overview of the data and then also um, the children. And I just noted their genders there because in, in some families it was important whether the, the siblings were, were, were sisters or brother and sister. So, but that's just a sort of overview. And so what I'm going to be doing now is it's, it's sort of a potpourri of data for lack of a better term. But what I wanna do, what I was interested in is, okay, I have these different contexts for multilingualism and family. How does this relate to Severus? You know, are the family's goals the same? And also, what new things can I learn about Severus and how it maybe evolves with different context for multilingualism in the family? So that's really where I want to go with the rest of this talk. And then um, again, so this is very much sort of it's newer data, newer thoughts, and I really welcome some discussion then at the end. Um, so. Um, just um, so the Severus model um, again so that's the Severus model there you can so I really want to think okay how do I apply this to this new data so I think in all of the families it was very clear to see sort of the difference um, efforts that family members, parents were making to ensure that their children were competent speakers of the particular language. And this was across the board and it was very clear um, in the families, but the, the example that I picked, again, this is a potpourri of data. I'm just sort of picking bits out that I feel maybe best illustrate a particular case, but there's lots more um, data to talk about. But just to give you a sort of overview, um, I picked this one out. So this is one of the Polish families and um, Kasia has come home and she's telling her father what happened at, at school. And they're talking about this, this keyboard. And I have keyboard, it is the English word, but when I asked the family about it, they said, no, that, that would be a normal sort of barring in Polish. So we wouldn't really count that as an English word. But then Kasia keeps saying the word um, piano. And this I did bold as, um, as the English word, because then what happens later in the conversation here in turn nine is that the father then repeats the Polish pianino 
for her. And then she repeats it. And so I, I argue that this is an illustration of how the family, um, the parents try to ensure that their daughters are competent speakers, that when there is maybe this, this sort of gray area of the lexical gap, that they supply the word so that um, the children are competent speakers of Polish and continue to use Polish. It also has um, another function in here, and that's really that it reifies this pro-Polish family language policy. And um, it says, right, we are speaking Polish, and then we can see um, Kasia's turning and then aligning and reinforcing this um, pro-Polish family language policy. So very much in line with thoughts and um, Bonincin and Pugh's idea of language practices becoming language policies, for example. And then I just wanted to show you this. So this is from one of the Irish speaking families. So in, in both the Irish speaking families, the dad, the fathers were the Irish speakers, the mothers um, didn't have, didn't habitually use Irish with their children. And um, in this one, and the, the children attended school through the medium of Irish. Um, and what was clear from this was not only um, did um, the fathers make a great effort to ensure that there was confidence, but there was also, um, like the two small video efforts towards ensuring that the children um, had fun with the language and sort of different ways to encourage them to use more Irish um, in the home and with each other. So in this family, the father had this policy that whoever he thought spoke the most Irish for the week got Gwilgard Nushachtim, so Irish speaker of the week. And this is a diary entry. So this is one of the boys in this family would write me diary entries and then he'd put pictures with them. So that's that's why the names are blanked out because um, he wrote, of course, his siblings' real names that um, have been anonymized then in the research. So here he writes, um, I'll read it out to you and then I'll explain it. So, Kur Dadi Kesht Er Edan, Kain Da Vi Er Nana Vi Alorg Ega, Dirt Edan, Grey, I guess Dirt May, Neil Tu Hun Grail Gore Neshachtena Obulkench. So, um, the translation is Daddy asked Edan what color is the shirt he has to find. Edan said gray, and I said, You're not going to win gray or gore of the week. So <laughs> it just makes me laugh. So, this really kind of clever translanguaging in here. And I think that it's kind of funny. It's a nice example to me of how, yes, we think of family language policy, I think, sometimes quite strict as, you know, you have to speak this language. Here, to get around that, the father has made up this policy that you can have, you know, you have uh, and then the oldest son, so when his sibling says grey, says the word in English, then um, um, the older sibling then makes a, a pun, um, a very cute translanguaging pun, um, mixing the words gray in English and then grail gore and says grail gore, playing off the fact that his sibling used the English word. So this sort of agency that goes along with this and the very creative use of language. Now, in terms of local, so one of the things I was looking at, you know, one of the things that emerged with the transnational families was, and especially with the Polish families, was, yeah, you know, the idea was that the children would um, speak Polish um, as their peers maybe in Poland would, or that it would be clear that the, their home language was Polish. So that was the sort of 
idea, but what emerged and what I wasn't necessarily expecting from this was the very um, clear efforts that the parents made with language in terms of bringing their own educational experience, bringing their own local, their own Polish experience to then um, supporting their children's language use. And so in both the Polish families, they um, the parents had materials, learning materials that they would have used in terms of when they went to school in Poland and the, the picture with the violin. So we've gone from pianos in the first one, then now to violins was that they wanted their children to have this experience, this, this sort of Polish education experience, this sort of local experience, even though their daughters were growing up in, Ir in Ireland and they had um, therefore brought over books and worked with um, Polish literacy using those particular books. So I think that in terms of the Severus model, that this aligns nicely in terms of local, this sort of parenting happening. Um, I'd, I'd like to reference the work of um, Carmen Keeley, who's also here at NUI Galway, who talks about sort of parenting happening transnationally. And so bringing the local, uh, their Polish experience here to Ireland so that their children have this experience with language that is, in, in many ways, local to the parents. So now I'd like to talk about um, the Kurdish speaking families, the families who spoke Northern Kurdish. Now, of course, um, their, their migration trajectory is very different and their circumstances are very different from the Polish speaking families. What was very clear um, that was happening with these two particular families was that language shift was happening. And you could see it with the younger children, that they were not speaking much Kurdish really at all. And this was both from the parents' own, own reports, as well as the observations and the meetings with the families. And I'd like to very, very strongly emphasize that it had nothing to do with what the Kurdish speaking families, with what the parents were doing, or um, or it wasn't necessarily a resisting thing that much, maybe to some level on the part of the children. So it's, I, I don't think it has anything to do with the internal practices, with the internal what the families were, were doing or what they wanted. But to me, comparing the Polish families who had very, from, from my observations, very successful language maintenance to the Kurdish families where it was not happening so much, that it really shows this, um, this intersection between language and society. So I just like to read a few quotes here. So these are translated um, from Northern Kurdish by my research assistant, Azad Izzedine. And um, so here we can see that the parents are speaking Kurdish, um, and it's that they are trying to um, also in it, encourage the children's um, positive emotional relationship with the language by not being forcedly, but that, you know, they say they can't understand when the children speak English, which tended to be, be true as well, that um, the parents were, were maybe not very were not necessarily that confident in their English language skills. So they would speak Kurdish to the children, but the, the children kept a lot of times answering in English. And, um, and so they would say, well, we don't understand. And um, for, for those of you who research family language policy, you know from Lanza's continuum that that's actually a really good strategy in terms of fostering the use of the minority language in the home. But it wasn't working so well. And we also saw this with the other families. So this is a very long transcript. Um, and here I'm asking, um, so Alan's 14 and Sarah's eight, I believe. And so I'm asking them, Sarah, do you speak Kurdish? Do you, when your dad speaks to you in Kurdish, 
does he always speak to you in Kurdish? And they say, yeah, um, you know, sometimes if he's relaxed, he speaks English. And I say, well, do you speak, speak Kurdish back? And then Alan relates, no, when my dad says speak Kurdish, so he will lay down the family language policy. What happens is that the other children, the young children, um, they are silent. So then after five minutes, silence, and then it goes back to English again. And um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the Lynn Fogel Wright's work, she talks about how silence is a strategy for, um, for resistance. So here, resisting at some level the use of, of Kurdish. And then Alan says, okay, he does speak Kurdish and he's the eldest in the family. So he would have grown up in a Kurdish speaking area um, for, for most of his life. And he says, no, I have no problem speaking any language. And so I'd like to take this thought forward. So in talking about the Polish and the Kurdish speaking families, and I, I realized that because this project is ethnographic and really trying to get deep down into the family's lives that I don't have a large sample. Um, but in talking and in, in um, thinking about this different data, I think that there's a number of explanations why this is the case. And I think it has to do with not only sort of avenues for output in terms of the traditional, you know, out, um, input and output model, but also it has to do with embodiment. And, you know, the children can see the language as something they can live through, but that's not the case with Kurdish. So um, here I'm showing a number of different pictures um, around the local area that shows um, the use of, well, first of all, there's Polish complementary schools, the amount of, of books and, and literacy engagement activities that the children have access to, and then also sort of what I see as sort of a, a general acceptance of um, Polish speakers as a minority in Ireland, whereas not only, um, whereas in Kurdish, these opportunities are not readily available for these families. And in both the interviews, the parents said that what they would love is to have a school, um, sort of a complementary school where the children could go and they could learn Kurdish, but that's not happening. Lack of access and not only, and I'm not just talking about Ireland, but also um, here in Ireland, the lack of access to Kurdish language materials, but also back um, in their homeland where they were very st stigmatized. So this sort of double layer. Um, and again, not just society here, but society um, from the place from which they were forcibly displaced. But despite, um, so uh, despite the sort of difficulties in terms of language maintenance, though, what also came through the, with the Kurdish speaking families, especially, and, and this did come through with all the families, I want to emphasize, but I just really like this one, these particular quotes from one of the Kurdish fathers, Kurdish speaking fathers, He's talking about the importance of multilingualism. So he says, I told him, and he's talking about Alan, who in our many, many conversations was just so enthusiastic about different languages, speaking different languages. And so here the father says, I told him, wherever you go, you cannot stand on your feet unless you have the language. If you have the language, you are not like someone who cannot say, swim. Let's say he learned to swim in a small river, right? He would be able to swim in France as well. He would be able to swim in the sea because when you learn to swim, you are still young. Language is the same. Even if he could not swim for a long distance, he would make it. I mean, he would not drown no matter how big or small that place is. Maybe he would not be able to swim like professional swimmers, but he would be able to make it. It is the same with languages. And then he talks more about um, Alan's enthusiastic, his real grow 
for languages. So, but Alan has friends from Spain and Poland and he talks to them in their languages. When I ask him what language is he using, he says, this is Spanish, this is Polish, for example. And when I ask him, do you speak this language? He says, dad, I'm learning. I know a few things. If I know their language, I use it. Um, so in coming back to the Severus model, I think to me, it still, it still works for the different context, but I think there's more to think about with it. And again, I'm not, even though this was, um, so the Severus model was developed in an autochthonous minority language context. And I'm not saying that multilingualism wasn't part of that initially, but just working with these different families who, who um, have transnational experiences, I started thinking more about the idea of maybe Severus being sort of the seat and then other things growing out of it, like multilingualism. Or I also thought of um, the Severus as sort of the end of a comet and this sort of like beautiful, shiny multilingualism flowing out of it. Um, but I don't have great drawing skills. So I thought I'd leave the picture alone for a while and end on that and just ask for your thoughts if anyone has any thoughts. But thanks again for having me here. It's an absolute honor and privilege to be here. So Spas Dinkwia Gurf Mila Magav. Uh, thank you very much for a very stimulating, wide-ranging discussion. Fantastic to hear about the work that you're doing on the ground with families. So interesting. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions, a little more than 10 minutes. Um, people can put their questions in the Q&A if they wish, or if anybody wants to raise their hand and ask a question, raise their hand virtually or put on their microphone and ask a question of Cassie. Dan, do you want to come in with a question? I do. I do yeah. Thank you very much, Cassie. I have a lot of questions and they point in sundry directions. So I'm tempted just to throw them out there and you can select sure. one. Thing. All right. The rest of them I'll ignore because they're terrible questions. So maybe, maybe there's one halfway decent one in there. Um, well, multi multilingual puns, I thought was kind of an interesting one that came up there. Um, I have, I suppose, the two things I was also wondering about. One is, I've, I've been kind of interested in the phenomenon of what, what I would call father tongue, not mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know if there's been research done on that, but I'd be really interested to know when somebody learns another language from the father and not from the mother. I'm just kind of interested in that. And the other question is just about, about, you're obviously focusing on, on, on oral, oral, oral competence. Um, in the language, but I'm just wondering about, it's so difficult to attain mastery in writing another language. I mean, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so I just wonder how, is, does that figure into either into your research or um, yeah, the, the question that's confronting families? Yeah, those are great questions, Dan. Thanks so much for them. Um, so the first one about the father tongue, that's really interesting because um, family language policy has been critiqued for mm -hmm. its emphasis on mother on mothers. And I don't think that it's a bad thing, of course, but the idea is that, yeah, it, it, the focus on mothers has reflected what is, you know, the gendered, what is often this sort of gendered norm of caregiving that the mothers tend to take. So this was, this was great. And I, I did hope when I initially wrote the application, I, I, really did want to look at fathers and so but you know in doing this kind of research you can't you can't really control because you know it, it depends on family's goodwill you know if they're willing to participate so I was just so thrilled when um most in all of the families actually um my main contact has been with the fathers and the fathers have played a very big role in this and particularly in the Irish speaking families where the father was the one who was the Irish speaker. And so like in other minority, in other heritage language families, you know, if one only one parent speaks it, then to be quote unquote successful, a lot of times they have to come up with all these strategies 
to make it happen because it's hard. And so what I saw was a number of strategies coming from um, the fathers in these cases. And um, it was a really good question, but what was your second question? The, yeah, the, sorry, the written, written language, sorry. The written yeah, language. yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And I really should have maybe said that at the beginning that the, the Severus model, again, so I developed it out of a specific context and I was really looking at early years. So I was looking at early years and um, sort of primary age children. So writing didn't come into that that much. And actually writing hasn't really figured that much in my research at all, not only because of the age of the children, but because that's more something that's done in school. And so actually the Polish speaking families were the ones that gave me, oh, I've been forgetting about this for a while because it was so Polish literacy was so important to them. Mm -hmm. And not only in terms of you know their family activities, but also um, in in one of the families, the girl was already planning to go to university in Poland mm -hmm. at the age of ten. So yes, yeah, so thanks. I think again, I think there's more more branches, more roots that I need to grow from this sort of seed of a model. Yeah, I was I was interested in partly because I was an undergraduate in Montreal, and so oh. obviously bilingualism is. Yeah. <laughs> You know, immensely well established, put it that way. But it was striking that people's ability to write, um, actually in both mm -hmm. languages, was was not a given uh, to write yeah. well. Yeah. Say. Um, but yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. And indeed, there are many thousands of languages in the world that aren't written at all yeah. and are, are thriving and in their own communities. So we have this idea that literacy is is crucial. It's very much a Western con concept. Uh, we have a question from Kieran O'Hogarty, who I presume is Uchtaran Nahalskalia, the university okay. president. And if it's if it's you, Uchtaran, uh, Tafalja Agus Fehrod, Cam, and this is the question on Simul Gurmahagat, can you comment further on the implications of the sense of language as living in a social, fun, or family setting for the curriculum for teaching Irish and indeed other languages? Well, thank you so much, Gurmila Finkesho. Um, I really think that that is the ultimate, the ultimate difficulty, but also opportunity, is that what happens, and this is a lot based on my work in Scotland. So in Scotland, I found that it wasn't, so the children weren't using much Gaelic, and they went to a Gaelic school, and it wasn't because Gaelic was in the school that they thought of Gaelic as a school language, but it's because Gaelic wasn't used in sort of the community that then it became the school language. So I think um, languages, any minority language that is used in the school, it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. And that's why I think Ira Corcovina is doing so well. Is, is taking this school aspect away from it. And so I think in terms of the implications for, for curriculum and pedagogy is just having this embodiment in the back of our mind of how can we make this fun? How can we make it um, a, a living language and make it so, um, so that it is, it is fun? And um, so I'd be really interested to talk to more teachers about sort of their strategies for doing this. You know, I have my own strategies when teaching in general, but I'd be really interested to talk more about that because I think that is the main implication that it needs to be fun. And also to acknowledge that as a minority language, you know, we're always fighting back against sort of these ideologies of contempt. Yeah. For Emil Mahagat the Huron, and it is indeed the president of the university who has joined us. And thank you, Kieran. I mean, Kieran actually launched our center yeah. way back before the pandemic, just a month before the pandemic. So I'm delighted you could be with us again, Kieran. We have a question from Lisha Nikhishchila. I was struck by the enthusiasm of the Kurdish family in terms of not only retaining native languages, but also multilingualism. I'm interested in how the Polish and Kurdish families reacted to Irish language acquisition of their children, for instance, in the school setting or if this came up, and I know the answer myself, but uh, yes. you, 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 you <laughs> yes, tell us. <laughs> so the answer is 
with extreme enthusiasm. Um, the, the Polish family, so um, a presentation that I had the pleasure of, of giving, a, gosh, in 2020, March 2020, with the seminar with John in Poland, um, the last chance to go anywhere. <laughs> Um, was about the Polish families learning Irish and how in one of the Polish families, um, the mother had written down sort of Diagwit and, um, you know, Konstatu, a basic conversation, Askwilga, but using Polish orthography. And every day on the way to school, this particular Polish family would practice it. And the mother would also always say Slon, to people around Galway, so very much enthusiastic um, about it. Same with the Kurdish families as well. But one of the main um, problems was with the Kurdish families, um, the school seemed to be putting up, it, it was sometimes a bit unclear, but it seems that um, Alan, because he arrived here after the age of 10, that the teachers were maybe saying, you don't need to learn Irish being more discouraged from learning Irish. And then in the other Kurdish family, um, EAL classes tended to coincide with Irish classes. So that just seemed to be a convenience. So I have written about how actually this, this sort of stance towards Irish is, is A, not at all in keeping with the family's own desires. They don't see language as a problem. Language is a gift to them. And, um, but how this sort of monolingual ideology, as, as John has, has argued, has been um, the case for the Irish state, is filtering through. And so they're, in some cases, being denied access or being discouraged from using the Irish language. And, um, yeah, so thank you so much for that question, Lishach Gurmila. Thank you, Lishach Gurmila, Margaret Lishach. Uh, we have no more questions now, so we have time for one more, but uh, if anybody doesn't jump in, I might ask a very quick question myself. Uh, I will so, because I don't see anything in the Q&A box. The, the, the quick question, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Obviously, your work is very ethnographic, very qualitative, mm -hmm. but has any assessment been done by Ira Karkarina of the success of Tusma? Of course, it could be very difficult uh, to, uh, to, yeah. to work out a, 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 a fair methodology that would take all of the social factors into account. But has any, has any assessment been done of the scheme? Yeah, there has been. And it's been recently published in the Journal of Home Language Maintenance. Um, so they did a much, uh, um, you know, a qualitative study and um, did a number of focus groups and a number of interviews. And um, it was great to see that... Um, their their observations what came out of the interviews coincided with what i've been finding as well yeah that's fantastic i'm gonna follow up with you for that reference so yes. it's almost five o'clock uh, ladies and gentlemen and uh, we've we've been here for an hour and it's been a very stimulating beginning to our discussions uh, and thank you as ever to uh, dr cassie smith christmas um, for her fascinating uh, and valuable and rich work on the richness model severus from uh, the West Kerry Gaeltacht and um, also working with uh, other uh, bilingual or multilingual families in Ireland. And our next uh, CAM uh, seminar will be in October. I should have checked the date before I looked at you. It's in roughly, yes, it's on the 28th of October where Sarah Berto from um, GMIT, from Galway Mayo Institute of Technology will be speaking to us about her work. Hopefully uh, any interruption to our uh, IT systems will have been long cleared up by that stage. So we're delighted that people were able to join us today, despite the obstacles. So thank you very much again. Go to Mila Mahakrifasaveling and Yovek Kam, Agus Kadeshiv Slan.